So we're here today uh, to talk uh, about National Heart Valve Awareness Day uh, in conjunction with the Alliance for Aging Research. Uh, and just a few words about valvular heart disease. In general, valvular heart disease is less well known, uh, certainly among the public, uh, than coronary heart disease. When people think often of heart disease, they think of heart attacks, they think of coronary atherosclerosis, uh, they think of uh, the lifestyle changes uh, that we have asked them to make, and many of the terrific advances that we've had, both in the, on the preventative side and the therapeutic side uh, in treating a, a coronary heart disease. And everyone here is, of course, very familiar uh, with uh, the uh, advent and advances in percutaneous coronary intervention and coronary bypass surgery uh, that have made huge strides, certainly in my professional lifetime, in both preventing and treating coronary heart disease. But even as our population ages, uh, including survivors of coronary heart disease who might not have a generation earlier, we are seeing increased numbers of patients with valvular disease. Um, and if you think about valvular disease, that too has evolved. Uh, when I first started out, we still saw a fair amount of rheumatic heart disease in the United States. Uh, it has become less and less frequent, almost disappeared, but we're starting to see it again uh, in newcomers to the U.S. because it remains a problem, an important problem in the developing world. As patients age, uh, of course, we are seeing the wear and tear phenomenon. The same thing that happens to your joints as you get older happens to your heart valves. Uh, they wear out. They were never really meant to last 60 or 70 years. Our evolution uh, hasn't really caught up with us, and we see more and more uh, patients as they get older, uh, the, the older patients who are otherwise in good shape uh, who are suffering from valve disease. And I would also mention we see patients who have infective valve disease, um, part and parcel of the opioid crisis, um, uh, infective endocarditis, um, which can be and often is um, uh, a result of using um, unclean uh, apparatus. Uh, can destroy heart valves and require our attention. So this morning, uh, we're going to hear from a number of distinguished um, uh, speakers. Uh, we have Dr. John White, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of WebMD. Uh, very, very pleased to have Dr. Jesse Adams, the Surgeon General of the United States, who has agreed to join us today. Uh, Dr. Lowell Sattler, um, a real pioneer and a master uh, in the transcatheter treatment of structural heart disease. Uh, we will also hear from Dr. Vino Tarani, our chairman of cardiac surgery, um, and Ms. Joanne Bailey, uh, who is a patient uh, who has benefited from the modern treatment of uh, a valvular heart disease with transcatheter therapy. So with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Ms. Sue Peschen, did I say that right, Sue? Uh, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Alliance for Aging Research, who will be our Master of Ceremonies. So with that, I again, I welcome you, I thank you for coming, and I hope you'll have an enjoyable morning with us. Sue? Please, please all join me in thanking Dr. Seides. Thank you so much. I want to thank you for the introduction and for hosting this important event at this very impressive center. Um, we're honored to have you and MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute as a partner and host for this really important day. Uh, the Alliance for Aging Research, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, is the leading national nonprofit organization working to accelerate research to enhance the experience of aging and health for all Americans. To raise awareness of heart valve disease, the Alliance for Aging Research worked with many national partners and established the first National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day in 2017. And it's now recognized every year on February 22nd during American Heart Month. The goal of National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day is to increase recognition of the risk factors and symptoms of heart valve disease, improve earlier detection and treatment, and ultimately to help save some lives. 
This year, we're very excited to have 65 partners from across the United States. Thanks to all of you for joining with us today. Before we get to the introductions, I want to also thank a few key partners for helping to make this important day possible. First, thank you again to MedStar for hosting us. Huge thanks to Dr. John White and his team at WebMD for their support and partnership on the issue. We're exceptionally honored and excited to have Dr. Jerome Adams, the United States Surgeon General with us today. Thank you, Dr. Adams, for your commitment to protecting and serving the public health, especially in issues like heart valve disease. And last, National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day wouldn't be possible without the Edwards Life Sciences Foundation and their Every Heartbeat Matters initiative. And we wanna thank you for your generous support. And now I have the privilege of introducing our speakers. Their full bios are in your packet, so I'm gonna keep it brief with each person before they speak. Our first speaker is Dr. John White. And Dr. John White is a popular physician and writer who's been communicating to the public about health issues for nearly two decades. Dr. White is the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, where he leads efforts to develop and expand strategic partnerships that create meaningful change around important and timely public health issues. Prior to WebMD, Dr. White served as the Director of Professional Affairs and Stakeholder Engagement at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA, and before that, as Chief Medical Expert and Vice President of Health and Medical Education at the Discovery Channel. Dr. White is a board-certified internist and continues to see patients in Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome Dr. John White. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be here at this great uh, facility, which I'll be honest, I had not uh, been here uh, before, even though I've lived in the district for a long time. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to serve on a panel with the Surgeon General. So I, I feel quite honored to, to, to be here. And and I've heard it from folks already. I know a lot of folks, uh, some, especially in the medical community, get mad at WebMD because their patients are now doctors and their medical degree is from Google and WebMD. But we are trying to, to raise awareness of certain health issues. And you can give me your side issues uh, later at the reception and happy to address them. But as, as a physician, as well, someone who's really passionate on health communication. I know a lot of uh, health providers are. Like, I recognize how important it is to raise awareness of heart disease, particularly valve disease, when it's a noisy environment out there in terms of we're trying to get people to understand about heart attacks. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying to get people to understand about valvular disease, which is a term that they often have not heard. And, and I joined WebMD, uh, as you mentioned, about six months ago because I was impressed with their passion to empowering patients with knowledge, and including our loved ones through knowledge and education. And, and through that expertise of, of getting people to understand what are risk factors for heart disease, and particularly valvular disease. And, and the goal really is simple, to provide credible information to consumers who can learn the first steps that they need to in order to advocate for their own health. And, and we talked a little bit about that beforehand, about how do we get credible information out there when there's a lot of voices out there who really aren't giving good information. And, and the key really is if patients and consumers have better information, they're going to get better health. So that's why it's so important to have MedStar and these institutions really work on, on getting good information. I must say I have great respect also for my friends who work at the Alliance for Aging Research and what they do every day, and I've known many of them for a long time. So, you know, I'll be honest, WebMD gets approached by lots of groups uh, to say, can you help us advocate for this issue? Can you help push information out? And we're not able uh, to work with everyone. But when Sue and her team approached me, uh, the, the response was absolutely, you know, we'd be delighted to help because we recognize that their interests are the same. How do we empower patients, consumers with good information? And the goal today, really, as all of you know, is listen to your heart. And it's literally, <clears throat> as well as 
figuratively, that we need to encourage people to recognize symptoms while at the same time knowing that sometimes the symptoms are very subtle or they may not even be there. And, and then how does that spur conversations with their health providers? And, and that's actually the approach that WebMD is always interested in. We're not trying to get patients to self-diagnose and self-treat them, themselves. We're really trying to get them to come in with the knowledge to their health provider. Uh, as Sue mentioned, I've been a physician for a long time, over 20 years in internal medicine. And, and many, like many of you, I've seen many patients with valvular heart disease and they're often confused about the condition. They don't understand it. Uh, this is probably the same. I've had patients when I've told they've had aortic stenosis, they're relieved because they're like, well, I didn't have a heart attack. I don't have heart disease. We're not recognizing that the symptoms uh, and the condition can be significant and, and can be severe and life-threatening if they don't change. I've had patients when talk about murmurs that they think it's all relating to you know, just rheumatic heart disease and, and you know, a disease of children and young adulthood as opposed to a disease is when we get older. So we really need to get good information about heart valve disease. And, and part of the challenge, as you all know, that um, you know sometimes our colleagues don't focus as much on auscultation, that we rely on just diagnostic uh, technology such as an echocardiogram as opposed to, to really listening uh, to patients and listening about their symptoms. And, and there's the other side where patients, and, and I hear this all the time, dismiss it as a normal part of aging. So if they have fatigue or shortness of breath, isn't that just normal? And we have to help sensitize them to the fact that it's typically not normal. And, and that's why it's important to have a close partnership with medical providers, to have premier uh, institutions such as yourself getting out good information and having good treatment options and, and good uh, therapeutic regimens. So we all need to raise awareness of heart valve disease and its symptoms, its risk factors, and its available treatment options. So, you know, the, again, the goal is listen to your heart. I always say it's literally, literally and figuratively. We need to know our symptoms. We need to listen to our bodies. We need to encourage our patients uh, to do that. And then we need to really promote that dialogue with medical providers. And, and again, thank you for including me in today's activities. Okay, great. Our next speaker is U.S. Surgeon General Vice Admiral Dr. Jerome Adams. Dr. Jerome Adams is the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. As the nation's doctor, the Surgeon General's mission is to advance the health of the American people. Dr. Adams's motto as Surgeon General is better health through better partnerships. Dr. Adams is committed to maintaining strong relationships with the public health community and forging new partnerships with non-traditional partners, including business and law enforcement. He's pledged to lead with science, love that, facilitate locally led solutions to the nation's most difficult health problems and deliver higher quality health care at lower cost through patient and community engagement and better prevention. As the Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, Dr. Adams oversees the operations of the U.S. Public Health Services Commission Corps, which has approximately 6,500 uniformed health officers who serve in nearly 800 locations around the world to promote, protect, and advance the health and safety of our nation and the world. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, hello everyone. Good morning. Is it still morning? You've got a little bit of time left. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here today. It's really critical that you're here helping us spread this message. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Sue. And, uh, and Dr. White, uh, you know, it's funny that you, you mentioned how folks give WebMD a hard time because the NBA uh, All-Star Game was just last weekend, and they have a celebrity All-Star Game. and. Uh, Originally, uh, some folks reached out to ask if I wanted to play in the celebrity game. Well, the long and the short of that story is I got bumped for Dr. Oz. Uh. But, uh, <laughs> but the important thing to know is that folks get, get their information differently now. We've got great websites set up where folks can, can come and find out information about valvular disease, but that's not how folks get their information anymore. It's pushed out to them through social media. Uh, they go to places like WebMD and Dr. Oz. And so it's important that we bring all these folks in because I really do believe in better health through better partnerships. And I'm looking forward to continuing to partner with WebMD and with uh, MedStar to make sure we get information to the folks that, uh, that matter. And, and that's 
valvular disease, that's opioids, uh, that, that's vaccinations. It's important that we reach people where they are, and so thank you again for being here. It's my pleasure to join with MedStar, Heart and Vascular Institute here. Uh, I, I'm a Maryland native, grew up in Maryland, have had many family members taken care of in this very hospital. And so uh, I thank you all for, for being here and, uh, and for your continued support. I'm glad we've got a room full of people who, uh, who are knowledgeable in the topic. I actually have a cholesterol uh, level that is uh, 210. So WebMD, what should I do? <laughs> now, now here, here's the trick. Here's the trick. My actual uh, HDL is, is, uh, is over 75. And so I've talked to tons of different cardiologists, and I get tons of different answers as to whether or not you should start on a statin or not because my HDL is, is actually uh, through the roof, and I work out and I eat right. Um, but, uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. We did three consults. All right, fantastic, fantastic. I want to thank Dr. Seides and his colleagues for hosting us here today. And uh, again, thank you to, to everyone who's on the panel. I, I want to start off by helping folks understand what the Surgeon General is and does, because unfortunately, a lot of times, folks don't even know what a Surgeon General is. I, I am neither a surgeon nor a general. <laughs> I'm actually an anesthesiologist and uh, a recovering internist. I actually started off in internal medicine and switched over. But I've worked in operating rooms with medical teams to improve the functioning of the heart. As a matter of fact, my, uh, my niece had congenital heart disease and I even carried my niece into the operating room and helped put her to sleep so that she could get her heart surgery. So I've, I've experienced this firsthand. I've seen the miracle of folks who get a second chance at heart wellness. And unfortunately, I've also seen the tragedy that comes from a disease that has left too long untreated. And I want you all to remember that too, because uh, I am still a practicing physician. I do about a shift a month at Walter Reed. And it's important that we are there to fish people out of the stream when they fall in. But it's important that we all think about what we can do to prevent people from falling in the stream in the first place, or to fish them out before they, they're, they're so far gone that, uh, that we can't save them or resuscitate them. And even for valvular disease, uh, earlier diagnosis and treatment, or as Dr. Seides mentioned, one of the big things that we're dealing with now is infective uh, heart disease uh, related to the opioid epidemic. So there are many things that we can be doing to prevent people from coming in in the first place, in addition to making sure we're catching them earlier, and then treating the ones who do come in when they come in. Uh, as was mentioned, my guiding principle is better health through better partnerships, because when the problems are complex, uh, we can't operate in silos. We're not going to solve this crisis uh, of, of, uh, of valvular disease that is untreated in our country just with the people in this room. We can't operate in silos, we need partnerships, and we need collaboration. And again, even though I'm preaching to the choir, I'm really excited about our Twitter chat this afternoon uh, because that, again, is a great way to reach new people and to help them understand what valvular disease is. So I want to back up a little bit because we're, we're recording this, and I, with apologies to some of the experts in the room, I'm just going to take a minute or two and go over some of the basics. Roughly 68 Americans, uh, 68, uh, Americans a day, 25,000 a year, die from heart valve disease. Yet survey research by the Alliance for Aging Research finds that three out of four Americans have little to no knowledge about this disease. Heart valve disease is a dangerous ailment made only more dangerous by the public's lack of awareness. The mainstream media covers many other important topics like diabetes and stroke and obesity, but there's a troubling blind spot when it comes to heart valve disease. So what is heart valve disease? Well, the heart consists of four valves, and it's their duty to keep the blood flowing in the right direction. But when one or more of these valves become damaged, heart valve disease can occur. The disruption in blood flow can lead to major consequences and even death. Common symptoms include shortness of breath, weakness or dizziness, pain or tightness in the chest, and fatigue. And unfortunately, as was mentioned earlier, far too often those symptoms are dismissed as aging or as just something that commonly occurs. I even myself had uh, infective endocarditis when I was younger, not related to my valves, but related to my, uh, to my kids. So when they say kids will kill you, they, they really will. My uh, middle son 
uh, actually passed along Coxsackie virus to me. And I uh, ended up having an infection in my heart and had chest pain. And I was on call in the hospital. Any residents in the room? I was in, on call in the hospital as a resident and had chest pain and ignored it and ignored it and ignored it until finally I was about to take a flight the next morning to go out and present at a conference and, uh, and said, I better get on the plane to make sure I don't have a spontaneous pneumothorax. I better, better go to the ER and get this checked out to make sure uh, I don't have a spontaneous pneumo and uh, ST segment elevation in all leads. And so the docs in the room will, uh, will know what that means, but uh, I just sat there with the ER doc and we both just kind of laughed uh, in between my chest pains <laughs> as we saw the EKG roll off. But the important point there is listen to your heart. Listen to your heart, because had I not listened to my heart, and if we're going to be honest, had I not been in that particular circumstance, I might not be here today, because I wasn't listening to my heart. I wasn't prioritizing what my body was telling me. Now, as Dr. Sides mentioned, one of the major risk factors for heart valve disease is age. One in 10 people over 75 has moderate to severe heart valve disease. The impact on older adults is often attributed to, to wear and tear, but high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, or other heart disease uh, risk factors can help contribute to heart valve disease. So again, it's not inevitable. We can prevent or delay the onset of valvular disease. It also affects the youngest among us. Babies can be born with heart valve problems that usually develop sooner or later into heart valve dis disease, problems like the one that my niece had. About 40,000 babies a year are born with a congenital heart defect, and nearly 600 newborns or infants under the age of one die each year from congenital heart valve disease. Again, unfortunately, many of those babies are sent home, are dismissed, uh, and, and aren't recognized or picked up soon enough. The Alliance's survey found that more than two-thirds of survey respondents who had a diagnosis of heart valve disease knew a limited amount or nothing about valvular disease before their diagnosis. Six in ten uh, diagnosed with heart valve disease didn't recognize their symptoms and were diagnosed because they went to a health care provider for a regular checkup or some other issue. So to our primary care docs out there who may be listening, it is important that we don't just leave this to the experts, but that we're aware of what heart valve disease is and who may be at risk. You can't assume that just because someone has an MD or an RM behind their name that they are automatically going to pick up on heart valve disease. We've got to have an index of suspicion for it. We've got to put that stethoscope on people again. And uh, unfortunately, we know as providers, we've gotten away from that. But people with heart valve disease don't always have symptoms, even if their disease is severe. For those people, a heart murmur is the most important clue, and it's why we have to touch the patients. It's why we have to put the stethoscope on patients every time they come in for an encounter. In addition to low public awareness, there are several other barriers to better health outcomes for people with valve disease, including where we live, how we live, and race and ethnicity. One of my signature efforts is to improve the health of our communities by making the connection between investments in health and resulting economic prosperity, we need to look at how our communities are prepared to fight all forms of heart disease. The analysis needs to go from the types of grocery stores a community has or doesn't have to the level of health care available. Again, all those are upstream causal factors. We know differences in communities drive disparities. Disparities in economic indicators like jobs and wages and disparities in a myriad of health outcomes, including heart valve disease. I want to talk a little bit about racial disparities in heart valve disease because I think that's an important perspective that's overlooked. African Americans experience risk factors for heart valve disease at earlier ages than their white counterparts. 59% of African American men and 56% of African American women have high blood pressure according to new diagnostic guidelines, putting them at increased risk for disease. Chronic high blood pressure increases the likelihood of heart failure a primary risk factor for heart valve disease, and African Americans develop heart failure before the age of 50 at 20 times the rate of whites. 20 times. 70% of African American men and 82% of African American women are overweight or obese. And African Americans are 1.7 times more likely to have diabetes than whites and more likely to develop serious complications. And with regard to access to care, there are disparities. A 2017 American Journal of Cardiology study 
found the odds of being referred to a cardiothoracic surgeon for treatment of heart valve disease were 54% lower in African-American patients than in whites. So they're more prone to the risk for heart valve disease, they're less likely to be diagnosed with heart valve disease, and they're less likely to be sent to an expert to treat their heart valve disease when it is diagnosed. And one more kicker. Research shows that African Americans with heart valve disease are 33% more likely to refuse treatment than white patients. And we were talking about this earlier. Yet, when treated, both groups had similar three-year survival rates. So we could make up so much of this gap if we could dig into why there's so much mistrust in our communities. And I'm sure you all wouldn't think of mistrust as one of the primary risk factors for disparities in cardiovascular disease outcomes, particularly when it relates to heart valve disease. But if we ignore it, we're never going to fix the problem, no matter how good we get at developing new and innovative techniques. And speaking of new and innovative techniques, a striking disparity is in the number of transcatheter aortic valve repair or TAVR procedures. This alternative to open heart surgery, wonderful, wonderful alternative to open heart surgery, has increased uh, significantly over recent years. But the number of African American patients who received this therapy from 2012 to 2015, now this is the most shocking one of all. Number of African Americans who received TAVR remained at 3.8% compared not to 93% in whites. 93% to less than 5% offered a procedure where when we offer this procedure and it's accepted, people have similar outcomes. What's HHS doing to combat heart valve disease? Well, we're supporting heart valve disease research in, in treatment and in care issues. The National Institutes of Health has supported research in specific types of heart valve disease, genetic markers for congenital heart valve disease. We're digging into those treatment disparities and trying to figure out how we can treat all people more equitably. And we're looking at innovations in imaging techniques and identification of new molecular pathways for, for the disease so that we can diagnose upstream. With regard to future directions, we can look forward to device regist registries, improving biomaterials so that the new valves that we put in last longer and are easier to place, um, advancements in imaging, diagnosis, treatment, and in translation. Now, before I take my seat, I'd like to make a, a uh, I'd like to acknowledge a success and, and make a challenge. Number one, I want to say to the folks here today, the success is yours. Uh, there's a lot that we can talk about in terms of bad statistics, but there's a lot going on good in this area if we can make it available to everyone. There's a momentum that is evident on this third National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. Your coordinated effort is very impactful. I'm glad that we'll hear uh, from a patient this morning who's experienced heart valve disease because the patient's voice is critical. It's absolutely critical, and particularly when we start to dig into why some people don't get diagnosed, why some people aren't accepting treatment, but then why some folks are. Important to hear their stories so that we can take advantage of those critical touch points. So I mentioned the success. I often leave people with a challenge. Um, I challenge you all to use your, your resources. We all are our own little WebMDs. Raise your hand if you've got a social media, uh, if you've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anyone? We all are our own little WebMDs, so use your platform to spread the word about heart valve disease. Join us on our Twitter chat tonight, and I'm also going to challenge my, myself. I'll participate in the Twitter chat this afternoon, and I'm challenging myself to highlight heart valve disease in future presentations about, about cardiovascular conditions, because if I'm going to be perfectly honest with you all, we need folks to become more and more aware of, of the risk factors, because we've got effective treatments, we've got effective pathways to prevent it from occurring in the first place. Today's an exciting day, and I want to thank you for all that you do and all that you are working on to improve the nation's health. And uh, my folks would kill me if I didn't do this. Um, they gave me my, my naloxone. I, I want to ask a question, particularly in this, in this crowd. How many of you all know CPR? Raise your hand. How many of you carry naloxone on you? There's one. So the fact is, statistically speaking, particularly here in the district, we are just as likely, if not more likely, to have someone come in this room right now and say there's someone overdosing in the bathroom 
as we are to have someone bust in that room and say someone's having uh, a heart attack right now. We need to get to the point where more people are willing to be first responders and respond to the opioid epidemic to help save a life by carrying naloxone. And again, that ties back in to heart valve disease because one of the biggest increases in people with heart valve disease now are people who are suffering from the opioid epidemic. With naloxone, you can save a life, you can connect them to care, you can ultimately get them off of drugs and hopefully prevent them from developing the sequelae of a lifetime of drug use, including heart valve disease. So thank you for the time, and I look forward to the continued conversation doing our Q&A. Uh, appreciate all that you do. I know that you'll continue to take care of the people in the Washington area, including my family members. And again, if anyone's got any advice over whether or not I should start that stat, and let me know. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Vino Tharani could not be here in person today, but we actually have a video mes message from him. And I realize that he needs no introduction for those of you in the room, but for those of you who are joining us via Facebook, Dr. Tharani is the chairman of the Department of Cardiac Surgery at MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute here at MedStar. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, and the American College of Cardiology. As a highly experienced cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Tharani specializes in the treatment of adult cardiac disease, coronary artery disease, aortic aneurysm, and arrhythmia surgery, and performs these surgeries using traditional surgical, minimally invasive, and transcatheter techniques. I'm Vino Tharani, the chairman of the Department of Cardiac Surgery at MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute and professor of surgery at Georgetown University School of Medicine. I want to thank and invite you for being here today for the National Valve Disease Awareness Day. I'm, I'm really happy that we're able to do this and host this at MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute in Washington, D.C. It's been an amazing journey for what's happened for the treatment of patients with valve disease. Fifteen years ago when I first started my practice in Atlanta, it was quite interesting. You had two choices. You were either going to have surgery or you were going to have medical therapy. And that's radically changed in the last 15 years. And now we're at a point where we're discussing structural heart, not just with a surgeon and a patient and a cardiologist and a patient, but now with a really big heart team. And that heart team is important for you to know as a patient on your therapies for valve disease. So there's the, uh, the cardiologist, there's the interventional cardiologist, there's a surgeon, there's an imaging, uh, uh, specifically cardiologists and radiologists who are specific in cardiac valve imaging but also echocardiographers. We really have a great um, pathway for you as a patient to understand how to manage your disease. The, op the options that we have are, are just numerous now. There's all the way from medical therapy to balloon valvuloplasty to minimally invasive uh, aortic valve or mitral valve surgery to regular traditional surgery. And now with the explosion of transcatheter valve therapies, we're really providing you as a patient the equipoise and a complete balance on how to manage your disease. So you're coming to your doctors with a completely new array of ways that we can help you. And we want to make sure that as you have disease problems with your valves, that you go to a center that allows you that full heart team assessment. And so you're not really pigeonholed into what you have or a procedure you can have, but really we're able to find the most optimal therapy for you and what works for your lifestyle. Moreover, we really want to make this patient-centered. Um, so the relationship that you have with your physician should be about your quality of life and how we can get you back to where you were before you had valve disease. So as I kind of give you a quick uh, overview of what's happened over the last 15 uh, years um, in uh, valve disease, I want you to be assured that your physicians are going to take care of you in a very heart team manner. And that's what you should expect. Where I'm really fortunate to uh, be here at Messer Heart and Vascular Institute, um, we have a phenomenal team of, of, of surgeons, cardiologists, 
non-invasive and interventional cardiologists, echocardiographers, uh, advanced practice uh, uh, physician practitioners. And so I'm really fortunate that we're able to provide not only commercially available FDA uh, techniques to you, but also a lot of the research trials which make us part of the cutting edge uh, pathways for helping you with your valve disease. I think this is a phenomenal time to have, unfortunately, valve disease that you may not want to have, but it's a good time because our options are so many. We want you to be very comfortable and educated in how you get treated, and it's our expect it should be your expectations and our uh, delivery for that type of uh, interaction with you. So I'm sorry that I'm not with you today. Uh, I had to be out of town, but. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, special day about valve disease, um, and I want to specifically uh, thank uh, the, um, uh, all of the people who have put this day on together here at MedStar uh, Heart and Vascular Institute uh, in the Zirkin Heart Hospital to allow you to spend some time with us. So uh, look forward to, uh, uh, to your um, treatment uh, options for valve disease. Thank you so much. Okay, terrific. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Sattler, who also needs no introduction to those of you in the room. Uh, Dr. Sattler is medical director of the Cardiovascular Training and Educational Center and director of coronary interventions here at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. Dr. Sattler was one of the key physicians in the launch of the Structural Heart Disease Program, developed the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program in collaboration with Children's National Medical Center, developed Code Heart in collaboration with AT&T, a wireless application for the sharing of ECGs and real-time video conferencing. He serves as principal investigator for 21 research protocols and writes and publishes extensively on intensive cardiology. Please join me in welcoming him. <clears throat> thank you. Um, I wanted to thank all of our guests today for your time and attention and the recognition of valve disease awareness. I was particularly intrigued by Dr. White's reach with 79 million users every month for WebMD. I, I reach 100 every month with our <laughs> newsletters, so I figured 79 million 100 if we could combine our resources together. Um, valve disease uh, makes its entrance by precipitating or worsening heart failure. It's unfortunate that many physicians as well as patients are unaware of the survival statistics related to heart valve disease. For example, although everyone shudders when a patient has the new diagnosis of lung cancer, the five-year impact on survival of untreated aortic stenosis is worse than that of lung cancer. In addition, the annualized incremental cost of heart valve disease are substantial in the face of a growing and aging population. Mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis remain common problems. Their natural history often involve a prolonged asymptomatic state that is managed frequently by primary care physicians. There are no known drug therapies that stop the progression. Approximately 45% of native valvular heart disease is aortic, with 5% of people aged 65 years and older and 13% of those aged 75 years having symptomatic aortic stenosis. Approximately 1.5 million people in the U.S. suffer from aortic stenosis and about a half a million within this group suffer from severe aortic stenosis. An estimated 250,000 patients with severe aortic stenosis are symptomatic Without a new valve, approximately half of these will be dead within two years. Mitral regurgitation is the most frequent form of valvular heart disease. In the U.S., its prevalence increases with age. The most common finding is leaflet prolapse, which results in various degrees of mitral valve incompetence. Despite the American College and American Heart Association recommendation, for surgical intervention in adult patients with significant mitral regurgitation, many patients remain untreated. Current estimates indicate that only one in 40 patients with moderate or severe mitral regurgitation 
undergo surgical treatment. The clinical effectiveness and benefits of surgical interventions, as Dr. Tarani had described, for valvular disease are well documented. However, there is limited evidence on the direct healthcare cost of valvular heart disease and even cost comparisons in the treatment of different types of valvular disease. Insured expenditures and importantly, patient out-of-pocket out of, out of costs associated with valvular heart disease are not well understood either. Prior studies have focused on the Medicare population and provide little, if any, evidence on the U.S. aggregate healthcare cost. Undertreatment may result from an overestimation of operative risk, underestimation of symptoms, or misclassification of severity. Long-term clinical outcome results have established that medical management is often ineffective. In patients with asymptomatic mitral regurg and aortic stenosis, watchful waiting for symptoms has proven to be too late. Surgical AVR is a cost-effective alternative to medical management in most patients. When curative, effective valve surgery relieves the patient of the symptom burden and thus the healthcare burden of the unaddressed valve disease, making it an effective solution. Because valvular heart disease is so impactful, there has been an intent interest which has focused on improved therapies. Research into clinical trials allows access to newer therapies with greater potential and is supported by the FDA and CMS. By simplifying guidelines, increasing the distribution of educational material online through smart devices, enables the education of doctors regarding the clinical importance of detecting valvular disease earlier. MHVI is beginning to use big data to help in the identification of those patients at risk. Artificial intelligence is now assisting in the interpretation of images and will link symptoms with therapy management and options for practitioners to implement guidelines. Valvular heart disease clinics will become a location where the specialists who are collaborating will organize better healthcare delivery. In summary, there is a growing awareness of the burden of valvular heart disease worldwide and the adoption of minimally invasive treatment options will be expanding. Thanks to new device technologies and progress in advanced imaging, great developments are gaining momentum in high risk and inoperable patients. Increased healthcare expenditure in the symptomatic aortic and mitral valve cohorts may be needed in the future due to the aging and growing U.S. population age 65 and older. However, technology may increase the, tech, the attractiveness of earlier aggressive treatment over medical management alone and offers the potential to improve patient outcomes while lowering the cost of care and improving quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sattler. Um, the last person that we have to feature here is really what this is all about. It's Joanne Bailey, a patient who is actually treated at MedStar, and I think that's what makes uh, this much more real. We can say a lot of statistics and tell you about the signs and symptoms, but hearing someone's personal experience is really where it's at. So we thank Joanne for sharing her experience, and please join with watching, me now, watching her now. By looking at an echocardiogram, they determined that there was something wrong with my heart valve. The valve leaflets over time in some patients can develop calcium. They become restricted in their motion, and then the flow through the remaining orifice gets uh, reduced. I noticed that I was having problems breathing, shortness of breath. The symptoms related to the narrowing of the valve include chest pain, shortness of breath, and even passing out. I don't think I was listening to my heart at all. TAVR stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. We do not open the chest. We look for some access site, usually the femoral artery. The valve is compressed down onto the shaft of a balloon and then is delivered through the vascular space inside the patient's valve. 
the balloon is then expanded and that expands the new TAVR valve inside the patient's own valve and therefore replaces it. This is all done under local anesthesia. If I wouldn't have had the TAVR done, I would have tolerated the shortness of breath. I believe my lifespan might have been a year and a half to two years. The typical duration of hospital stay is anywhere between two to seven days, depending on the individual. And the recovery, if there are no complications, is very quick. Went in on a Sunday, had the procedure on a Monday, and discharged on a Wednesday. And I went home and I felt great. We've completed over 1,600 procedures in the last 10 years. And so we have a good understanding of the complexity of the patient, the unique challenges that many of the patients have, and we have a lot of different valve options to give us the flexibility to give the patient the best result. The research and the clinical trials definitely saved my life. Wow, good stuff. Okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask our esteemed guests? Any questions? Well, we're asking WebMD all day, every day. You're <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I do want to direct you. We are doing a Twitter chat today from 1 to 2 p.m. You can join in by following at Valve Disease Day, and the hashtag is Valve Disease Day. We also have a website, valvediseaseday.org, and uh, just welcome you to participate the rest of the day. And thank you so much for everything you do all day. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I'd love to ask Dr. Saidi and Dr. Sattler. I mean, what do you think? based on your interaction with patients is the reason for, uh, for, for the disparity, the long chain. What, what can we do to better diagnose? What can we do to get less um, people of color refusing to use new technology? That's one of the biggest ones that's a shock to me. But thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a combination of uh, better access to health care, uh, uh, balancing their resources, not only for the initial diagnosis, but the follow-up. Because the outcomes, I think, vary depending on race, unfortunately, but I think that's resource related. The money it takes for the follow ups, uh, the attention to the detail in the follow up. And so we try to initiate different tools to do that, both electronically with sending messages, but also with Dr. Taylor's transition clinic, in which we know there may be a higher risk population that has less resources we can move them over to that transition clinic to make the transition from the inpatient to the outpatient care uh, more palatable. And I, you know, I, I, we talked about this before. I think a lot of it has to do with trust, the larger trust uh, in a system uh, that has not always treated people equitably. Uh, the larger system that has not always treated Equitably. Going all the way back to Tuskegee and even before that. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a, and I, so I, I think it's just a, it's a larger social question. Um, you know, certainly all of us who are practitioners, or many of us, I, I mean, I'll say all of us, I believe that we treat our patients equitably and look to develop trust in all of our patients. But there's a world out there that goes way beyond each of us. Uh, and I, I, I would hope that we would see an evolution uh, uh, in, in, the, the, in what you, you mentioned, which is an extraordinary statistic, which, of which I was not aware myself. An evolution as we see an evolution in society uh, that allows us to trust one another, frankly. Uh, more than I do think we also have to address the issue of unconscious bias. So we all feel that you asked us, do we discriminate on people based on sex or race or ethnicity? We all say that, but there's been lots of literature that talks about in the context of virtual patients, all things being the same, except race or sex being different. Or are they treated differently in terms of referral or various therapeutic options in terms of pain control? We see that in congestive heart failure as well, as well as in the number of minorities in clinical trials. So I think as health providers, we also have to think about our own behaviors and interactions, because um, I do think it exists, and, and how do we best manage it to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity. People can still decide not to proceed, proceed with a certain therapeutic option, but it has to be informed. 
And, and I think at times, um, and, and we've seen this in congestive heart failure, that sometimes patients will look at a particular patient and think, well, you're not sick enough, or you won't be able to undergo this therapy, or you don't have the economic needs. Uh, you won't so follow through. You won't follow important. through, and we see that in, in anesthesia, where uh, where African American people of color are much less likely to be offered um, a alternative to opioids for pain management, because there's a belief that they won't follow up properly, and so they're not even offered in the first place, or they're not or it's not presented to them in the same manner. And, you know, we talk about informed consent, and uh, that's a whole different topic we could have, but. Uh, just looking at the way we present options to people. And you know, uh, we present one option to one person as this is the way I think you should go. And to another person, we present the exact same options that we go, eh, you know, maybe it, this could work for you, but, but you know, when we impose, like you said, our own biases on, uh, on the way we present uh, options to folks. But, but I do think there is one important aspect. The government needs to back out off on outcome metrics. Mm -hmm because what they're doing is they're biasing the system against certain ethnic groups. If you know that you'll have a poor outcome because of poor surveillance, poor follow-up, and you're going to be punished for it by a readmission penalty, that's not going to fix the system. So there, there has to be some space to change the metrics that we're being held against so that we can provide better care to a more global community and not select patients that are likely to do better because that is what's happening right now and that's what you're concerned about. Yeah. And we need to reset the scope in which we're using outcome metrics uh, to help uh, manage a more diverse group of patients. And Dr. Rabin and Dr. Saeed and I had that conversation earlier. We're moving towards a pay for value world, but we need we need, quite frankly, you all. We need uh, MedStar, we need institutions to step up to the plate and help us figure out how we get from where we are, a fee-for-service world to a pay-for-value world, in a way that doesn't create perverse incentives. There was a question in the back, but I wanted to ask you one quick follow-up question, because I really do believe that we need to be much better at communicating, and the folks up here can't talk to everybody. Really, we need all of you all on board how, uh, any tips for folks on how to, how to effectively use social media, the internet, how, how they can be effective advocates, because there's nothing more powerful than one of you all out there armed with the facts, but there's nothing more dangerous than one of you all out there in the community, again, without the correct information, whether it's on vaccines or opioids or on valuable Sure, and you talk a little bit about that beforehand. And it, there was a, a great article in the New York Times recently that talked about how fake news, just leave it at that, <laughs> in terms of the political agenda, what impact does that have on our lives? So fake news in health actually can have a significant yes. impact in, in how long we live and what we may die of. And that's been my own frustration, mm -hmm. particularly in the issue of anti-vaxxers, who in some ways in social media, the more provocative you are, the more attention you get. And there's a lot of doctors on social media. Some of them are clinicians. Some of them call themselves doctors as I'm not making a value judge, a naturopath, or whatever. And consumers often can't figure out that information. So my interest has been, I, I was talking about, when you look at two of the top you know, social media folks, that are like folks like Dr. Oz, and they're good and bad there, but then even when you look at MedStar and Georgetown and the Kaisers, um, their numbers are, are very low. And, and I think some of it is helping them work in their social media platforms. There's actually a science in terms of how you optimize search. Uh, and I think in many ways, clinicians and academicians and physicians, and I spent a lot of time in government, is this attitude, I'm going to get the best information out there, and I'm going to parse this information so carefully, and I'm using words that people don't understand. Mm -hmm. I used the word malodorous the other day, and someone's like, what? No one uses that. <laughs> 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 Apparently they don't, but we forget that, because they have, they have, we have a part of us that we use all the time, and I think part of it is finding folks that are active in social media. I joke, your social media folks and institutions should be in their 20s, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not always the case, because those are the folks that know it. And then I think on all the folks that have their social media accounts, 
it is just about getting good information out there. And in some ways, the reason why WebMD is so popular is because it has so much content out there. But what's a differentiator that folks may not know, every piece of content that's on WebMD identifies who reviewed it by name and the date that it was reviewed. Most places don't do that. And, and this is a longer discussion. How do consumers understand who to trust? Because if you blog, all of a sudden, you're an expert out there. And that's not always, it's usually not the case. Well, the, the extreme democracy of social media. Of, mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, 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 you know, uh, when all we had was newspapers and print media and the, the network TV, there wasn't extreme democracy. Yeah. There, was a, there was a filtration system. Sure. And so it has the risk of creating an echo chamber. Yeah. As you, I mean, the vaccine business is the best one I can think of. You know, the anti-vaxxer uh, echo chamber of uh, vaccination. And since we're on Facebook, it's important that we all say this. Vaccines do not cause autism. They are one of the greatest public health advancements of the last <laughs> I do have a question, but since you mentioned outcomes, I just wanted to, to say something about that as well. And that's uh, that you know the, the patients who we represent, um, they feel that sometimes the outcomes that we're using don't always represent what's most important to them as patients. And so we're hearing a lot that they would love to be asked by their providers when they're talking about their treatment or how their management, what's most important to you? Because it may not necessarily be the same thing as the outcomes that the providers are measured by. Um, it's a concept called motivational interviewing that we're trying to teach our medical students and residents, asking the patients what matters to them because to your patient, they aren't going to care whether or not their hemoglobin A1C rate comes down by 10 or 15 percent, but they are going to care if they can go to their kid's softball game or if they can make it to their daughter's wedding. So I think that's a great and point. That could make the difference between the patient coming back to get their treatment and not coming back, which gets to my question. And um, we know that there's a lot of underdiagnosis. We know that there's a lot of undertreatment. What can we do as a community to get patients after they are diagnosed coming back to get treatments? For some of these patients, they're told it could be 20 years before you actually need a new heart valve or uh, or, or repair. And come, we want you to come back every year, have another echocardiogram. And uh, we lose a lot of patients. And as we know, if you wait too long, your heart can be damaged or you can die. So what can we do as a community to keep the patients coming back and to keep the providers in the game engaging their patients so that they do come back and get the treatment at the right time? Well, that's where you have to rely on technology to help. And the introduction of the electronic health record with um, searching data fields, looking for patients, as you described, that have been identified early, in which the providers may forget about or the patients may forget about, may be able to be surfaced uh, and, and looked and evaluated and automatically reached out to bring the patients back. I mean, I think that's what we have to do, because if someone feels well, you don't have the compulsion to follow up as opposed to the sick patient, but if we start using some of the tools of the healthcare technology, I think we will have the opportunity to, to treat patients earlier, to find them, and to bring them back on a more routine basis. I think we also have to have innovation in the way we provide care, and we're seeing more clinics being held in communities and at work sites. Uh, we had this discussion earlier. You, you know, we talk about why it's so hard to get folks from uh, disadvantaged uh, environments and minority populations to come in, but we expect them to take time off work, and they may not have time off work. Uh, we expect them to find someone to watch their kids, and they may be a single mother or not have someone to watch their kids. We've got to figure out how we um, rethink the way we deliver care so that that care encounter isn't such a high burden that they go, eh, you know, I'm feeling all right. The doc told me to come back. It's time for my checkup, but I'm feeling all right, and I don't have someone to watch the kids, and I don't have transportation to get in, and I can't get time off work. So we'll just wait until next year, and next year becomes five years and ten years, and the next thing you know, they're showing up with, with what is now intractable disease instead of something we could have prevented. Excellent discussion. One more question? One comment. Um, Cameron Redding, um, registered nurse here, uh, recently worked in cardiovascular and intensive care. And I would say one of the challenges is cultural competence in care provided. Um, I 
took care of a gentleman, African American gentleman in his late fifties, and he had a large aneurysm, and it was aortic aneurysm. And we were speaking with him, telling him the importance of him going to surgery that evening. He was actively refusing care. Um, I got my amazing nurse managers involved. They weren't able to persuade. We got uh, our cardiac surgeon came down, Dr. Molina. He was not able to sway him. It wasn't until I said, let's call this much, that we were actually able to get him to understand, although your pain is resolved, you're on a lot of medication, available. You're on a lot of medication that's helping you. Um, so I would just say culturally competent um, in care provided is something very important in allowing us to get away from all of these disparities so that patients can receive the information that they need in a way that couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. Many folks don't know, but I used to run the State Department of Health in Indiana, and we were all about that. Here's an important add-on to that. Um, we do a, we're doing a better job of workforce diversity training, which is making sure everyone is culturally competent. We don't do such a good job of diverse workforce training. And we know that the more diverse your workforce is, the more likely a patient come, coming in will have a care encounter with someone who thinks like them, who looks like them, who, who speaks the same language as them, who comes from the same background that they came from and can relate to them in a way that, again, you said the, the wife related to the, to the husband. Uh, far too often, many folks come into a care encounter and it's all foreign to them. It's a bunch of aliens trying to tell them what they need to do and they can't relate to anyone. But if we do a better job of diverse workforce training in addition to workforce diversity training, then we're going to be more likely to be able to optimize that touch point and again reach out to that to, to every patient when uh, they're most in need of our care so thank you for that comment i think it's a great one to to finish on uh, and I, I think that's something we all need to take from this we can have the best uh, scientific advancements in the world and TAVR is a wonderful scientific advancement but if we can't get people diagnosed if we can't bring them into care if we can't get them to accept it then it means nothing it really means nothing and so we can't just think about what's the the, the latest greatest technology if we don't aren't also thinking about how we make it accessible to everyone out there in an equitable way oh excellent i love this discussion i wanted to give a shout out which we can't ignore here to the association of black cardiologists the executive director cassandra mccullough is in the room with us and a lot of the statistics <laughs> Dr. Adams used today came from researchers that are members of ABC and they are going to be having a piece in blackdoctor.org uh, within the next day or two if it's not already up about these disparities issues in heart valve disease. Please join me in thanking these amazing speakers. Thank you.